What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're going to talk about heparin. It's a very important anticoagulant used very commonly in the medical field. It's a really important one, so let's go ahead and get started on it. All right, Ninja Nerds, so let's go ahead and get started on the mechanism of action of heparin. So heparin is so darn cool, and we'll talk about the different types of heparin, but before we get into the unfractionated heparin, the low molecular weight heparin, and another synthetic type of heparin called Fonda Paranox, I want us to briefly go over the coagulation cascade. If you guys remember what happens, because it's important, if you know the mechanism of, of, of how this actual coagulation occurs, then the mechanism of action of heparin is gonna be so simple, and you'll be able to understand the downstream effects of it. So. You guys remember, whenever there's some type of damage to the blood vessel or there's some type of injury to the endothelial cells or there's a hypercoagulable condition or there's stasis of blood flow, Verco's triad, right? There's an increased risk of forming thrombi. How does that happen? You guys remember, the underlying collagen is exposed. What happens? Von Wildebrand's factor is combined within that collagen network. It's like, extremely uh, um, uh, desired by the platelets. The platelets will then come and aggregate and bind to the von Wildebrand factor. Once they bind, what happens? It triggers those granules to degranulate and release ADP, thromboxane A2, serotonin. What does that do? That causes more platelets to come to the area. What else does it do? It also causes the platelets to start to stick to one another, right? We talked about all those mechanisms in coagulation uh, cascade in our hemostasis video, right? Once this happens and the platelets become activated, if you guys remember, they develop this kind of like negatively charged surface. That negatively charged surface is super attractive for certain types of coagulation proteins. If you guys remember, one of the big ones is factor 12. Factor 12 when it reacts with this negatively charged surface, it becomes activated. And then if you guys remember, what does factor 12 do? Factor 12 activates factor 11. And then if we just keep going down this cascade here, factor 11 then will activate factor 9. And then if you guys remember, there's another molecule here, which is gonna be called factor Eight. In factor eight, we'll talk about where he gets activated and how he comes into this. We're just going to throw him in in a different color for a second here. Factor eight is also going to be utilized, and he's going to be activated in this process. He gets activated through what's called thrombin, and we'll talk about how. But he actually is going to be utilizing the steps. So now you have factor nine and factor eight. They combine, and when they combine, we're going to change the color to change the type of pathway here. Let's turn it purple. Then what we do is we take another molecule here called factor 10. What happens is factor 10, he gets activated. And then what happens is factor 10 then goes on to this next step where he combines with another factor. We're gonna make this a different color again for purposes, we'll explain why. But there's another factor called factor five and factor five is going to be utilized in the step where factor 10 and factor five, factor five is activated by thrombin again. And what happens is this factor five and factor five A, along with another molecule called platelet factor three, turns another molecule, a really important one called prothrombin. And if you guys remember, this is actually factor two. He gets activated into the activated form of Factor two, which is thrombin. Now, the next thing that happens is thrombin then comes over here and he actually does a couple things. He stimulates, the, he activates factor five. He also activates factor eight. And guess what else the son of a gun does? He also comes over here and activates another molecule. Let's make it a different color just to make this all look pretty it's called fibrinogen. Fibrinogen, if you guys remember, we said is an actual soluble uh, protein. But whenever you polymerize them, you take one fibrinogen and you start polymerizing with a bunch of uh, fibrinogen molecules, what happens? You get fibrin, right? And fibrin is an insoluble. It's an insoluble type of protein. 
And so it's good for making the blood more viscous and thick to help with that coagulation process. Now, once we have fibrin, we're gonna do another enzyme, one more enzyme. Wow, thrombin does a lot, doesn't he, guys? Well, you're gonna see why that's important. But guess what else he does? He also takes another enzyme and activates another enzyme. And this enzyme is called factor 13. Now, factor 13 in its activated form is extremely important because guess what it does? It takes the fiber molecules and combines the fiber molecules into a nice cross-linking like mesh. So now I'm gonna take this fibrin and this fibrin, when it reacts with this actual factor 13, look at this guy, he's going to react here. It's going to take the fiber molecules and form a beautiful fibrin mesh. So now we're gonna get this fibrin mesh and I'll show you what that means here. Now I'm just gonna have, imagine I make these dots like lines. A bunch of dots are gonna make up a line, right? So again, if I were to kind of like show you here, that's a bunch of fibrinogen molecules. I'm gonna take and cross link these fibrinogen molecules and I'm gonna make these nice strands that are gonna really help to stabilize this platelet plug because I want this thing to be steady. I want to really hold and anchor that sucker in, right? Now, there's one other process that happens. This whole thing, if we go with, the, with this maroonish color from factor 12 to factor 11 to factor 9 and the combination of factor 8, this is all part of the intrinsic pathway. Intrinsic pathway, okay? So again, all the way when we talk about uh, again, factor 12 to factor 11 to factor 9 in combination with 8. When it converges and it comes down here to factor 10 in this purple pathway, factor 10 gets activated and then activates thrombin, which then goes and activates fibrin. All of this process from there, this is going to be your common pathway to forming the fibrin mesh. So this purple is going to be basically a part of your common pathway. And the common pathway is um, important because, and I'll, and I'll explain to you why here, there's a convergence on this specific pathway. Well, guess what? Whenever your blood vessels are injured, remember, they make another molecule here, right? They make a molecule here called factor three. Factor three will then act, will then react with another molecule called factor seven, and when these molecules react together, they actually are going to form a specific complex here that is really good at being able to stimulate factor 10. And when they stimulate factor 10, what does that lead to? That leads to the activation of thrombin and thrombin down to the fibrin mesh. This pathway is called your extrinsic pathway. Okay. Now, if you guys remember from the warfarin video, factor seven was the main one that was affected, right? Because it has the shortest half-life. And you remember we monitor the effects of warfarin based on factor seven through what's called the PT or the ratio called the INR, right? In the same way, we're gonna talk about heparin and we're gonna talk about very briefly about the different types of heparin, but they work by inhibiting specific enzymes in this pathway here, mainly the intrinsic and the common pathway. And we'll talk about the test that you utilize, it's called the PTT, right? The partial thromboplastin time. Whereas the PT is the prothrombin time, all right? So now that we know this basic coagulation cascade, where does heparin come into this? All right, heparin is a very interesting little molecule. So what makes it up is actually two different components. Let's use here red. Okay, so you have heparin, right? We're gonna basically sp uh, split heparin, right? You take it from a pig, so a bovine source. And what this heparin is, is it can get broken down into two components. One is you have what's called the unfractionated heparin form, okay? Unfractionated heparin is, there's actually two types. There's a high molecular weight and a low molecular weight. But really, when it comes down to it, really, we really consider the unfractionated heparin to be what's called the high molecular weight heparin. And I'll explain what I mean by that. The other type of heparin is called your low molecular weight heparin. So that's why we really just consider unfractionated heparin to be the heavy molecular weight heparin, and the other type of heparin to be the low molecular weight heparin. 
I'll explain why. Heparin is made up of two components. So imagine here these little dots. These are little monosaccharides. I'm going to put five of these monosaccharides together. So what do you call that? You call that a pentasaccharide, right? Same thing over here with the low molecular weight heparin. I'm going to make five little circles here which are representing saccharides. That's a pentasaccharide. Then coming off of it, I'm going to have this specific type of molecule here which we're going to call a gag. Okay? So you have a gag and then you also have this other molecule here called your pentasaccharide. These two molecules together make up the heparin, right? Now, the glycose aminoglycan, or GAG, is longer in the unfractionated heparin as compared to the low molecular weight heparin. It's really small. That's the real big difference. Honestly, the only difference between the unfractionated heparin and the low, mole no, low molecular weight heparin is really just the glycose aminoglycan structure. Well, why do we have two of them? Because this unfractionated heparin, because of this long glycosaminoglycan, he gets a little extra action. Let me explain what happens. Okay, so now what we got to remember is that in order for us to be able to inhibit this process, we need an enzyme that's going to oppose this, right? Some way, somehow, to keep the blood kind of antithrombotic. And we talked about this in the hemostasis video. So if you guys remember, the actual liver makes a beautiful protein here called antithrombin. Three. So this is a really cool molecule. Now, what happens with antithrombin-3? It's actually going to be very crucial that we understand this in comparison with heparin. Now, let's imagine here we put heparin, we're going to put him right into this blood vessel wall. So what we're going to say here is going to be our nice, beautiful little heparin. Guess what? We're going to make it into an H form so you guys remember that. Look at that. Here's our heparin, and we're going to put him just like that. Oh, yeah. All right, so we got that. That's our nice little cute little heparin here. We'll just be cute and we'll put heparin, right? And then binding into that is actually going to be this antithrombin-3. So let's put the antithrombin-3 inside of this right here. So antithrombin-3. So what happens is when heparin binds with antithrombin-3, it accelerates the activity of antithrombin-3, right? What does antithrombin-3 do? It does two things, depending upon the size of the glycosaminoglycan, which is the difference between the unfractionated and the low molecular weight heparin. I'll talk about that in a little bit, but for right now, just know that when heparin binds to antithrombin-3, antithrombin-3 is going to mainly inhibit thrombin formation, well, thrombin action, activating thrombin, so it'll inhibit the thrombin as well as inhibit the activation of factor 10. And if you think about it, regardless, if I inhibit a thrombin directly, oh, that's beautiful. And I do that through antithrombin 3, I'm going to inhibit the, the, you know, the formation of the fibrin mesh, inhibit a clot formation, or inhibit the clot from getting bigger. But in the same way, even if I inhibit factor 10, I'm going to inhibit, eventually, thrombin. I might get more of a downstream, of, a, a larger effect, because when you inhibit proteins farther up within a coagulation cascade, you get a more amplified effect. Because now from me activating factor 10, inhibiting factor 10, factor 10 activates tons of thrombin. Doesn't that make sense? So if I inhibit factor 10, I might actually inhibit a ton of different thrombins. Whereas if I just inhibit one thrombin. Uh, so that's kind of a beautiful thing with heparin. So remember I told you, heparin binds antithrombin 3, kind of like a cofactor, accelerates its activity to inhibit thrombin, and to inhibit factor 10. We want to be very specific though. The unfractionated heparin, because it has this large glycosaminoglycan, that allows it to inhibit both thrombin and factor 10. So let's write that in here. It can inhibit two types of proteins. When it binds with the antithrombin 3, it can inhibit both factor 2 and inhibit factor 10. Okay, and I'll show you like a little like animation of what, what I mean by this. So you can inhibit both factor 2, which is thrombin, and factor 10. That's a beautiful mechanism, and we'll talk about how that works. Low molecular weight heparin, on the other hand, 
When it binds with antithrombin 3, it only inhibits factor 10. So that's what I want you guys to remember about this. So it inhibits factor 10, but if you think about it, it's going to indirectly inhibit factor 2 downstream from that. There's another molecule, I'm just going to mention it very briefly, it's called fondaparinox. So we'll throw this last little molecule in here just so I mention it. Um, so fondaparinox is another type of heparin. We'll put it right here. It's a synthetic form of heparin. So you also have what's called fonda paranox. And all fonda paranox is, is it's just a pentasaccharide. It has no glycosaminoglycans. So it's a pentasaccharide, and all this guy really does is, is he just works by binding with antithrombin 3 and inhibiting factor 10. That's it, okay? He has no glycosaminoglycan structure. So this is a synthetic form of heparin. Now, here's what I want you to remember. It's very simple. So let's understand how this actually works. So let's say here I draw, we'll draw here an antithrombin 3 molecule. So let's say here I have antithrombin 3, okay? So here's my antithrombin 3 molecule. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to bind onto this antithrombin 3. I'm going to put in that pentasaccharide structure here. So let's say here I put onto this this pentasaccharide structure. So one, two, three, four, five, right? Then looping around this antithrombin 3, I'm going to have this tail coming out, okay? And imagine this tail kind of like a little dagger, okay? Now, when antithrombin 3 is activated, it actually binds directly with another protein called factor 10. So you can see how with the pentasaccharide structure, whenever heparin binds with antithrombin 3, it's going to directly inhibit factor 10 because it's bound to this complex. But the glycosaminoglycan the longer it is, the more it can loop around that antithrombin 3 and inhibit another factor that's here on the back. And guess what that factor is? Factor 2. So you need the long glycosaminoglycan in, orbit in, two, in, orbit, in order to inhibit factor 2. Okay? If you have the short glycosaminoglycan, you're only going to inhibit factor 10. If you have the long glycosaminoglycan, you're going to inhibit both factor 10 and factor 2. So I just wanted to give you guys a little uh, thing there to make sense of that. Now that we know the mechanism of action of heparin, one thing I want you guys to remember, just clinically, you have to think about these kinds of things cl clinically. Heparin's function depends upon antithrombin-3. So without antithrombin-3, would the effect of heparin even be, would, would it be good at all? No. So what does that mean? If someone is suffering from liver failure, this is an important clinical kind of like correlation here. If someone is suffering from liver failure, what happens to the production of antithrombin-3? It drops. And if you drop the antithrombin-3, you don't have something for heparin to bind to. So heparin's ability to work depends upon the production of antithrombin-3. So without antithrombin-3, is heparin even going to be able to prevent blood clots? No. So that is what's important. You have to remember that. There's another condition that you have to think about. This re leads to the decreased production. But what if you have a disease here called nephrotic syndrome, which is characterized by someone getting rid of a lot of protein in their urine. And guess what kind of protein they lose in their urine? Antithrombin-3. That's one of them. And if you lose this antithrombin-3, what happens to the ability of heparin to perform its function? It decreases because heparin depends upon the native production or amount of antithrombin-3. So if you lose the antithrombin-3, again, that's going to lead to the increased risk of clotting. So increased AT3 lost in urine. Because with people with nephrotic syndrome, they have proteinuria. They get a lot of protein in their urine. They also lose a lot of lipids in their urine. And because they retain a lot of water, they're hypertensive. They have edema.
Okay, so this is something that we have to take into consideration. I really want you guys to understand, again, antithrombin-3 production or amount inside of the body determines the overall efficacy of heparin. Okay, now that we've understood that, let's go ahead and kill these indications. All right, guys, so let's go ahead and talk about the reasons why we would give someone heparin. It's a very commonly used drug. One of the biggest things that I want you guys to remember, because we've talked about the antiplatelet medications, clopidogrel, persugrel, uh, ticagrelor. We talked about aspirin. We talked about uh, GP2B3A inhibitors, all of those things. We talked about warfarin. How do you know when you're going to be giving somebody this medication as compared to all the other ones, right? Heparin, in comparison to warfarin, is used more commonly for the acute onset of things. So it's very quick acting, okay? So it's, it's very, very short acting, it works very, very quickly, so it's more for acute types of conditions. So what do I mean? If someone has a DVT, right, you can give them heparin to treat the DVT acutely. Whereas with warfarin, it's more prophylactic prevention, right? So when someone is having an acute DVT or PE, Heparin is going to be the main uh, mechanism, a main drug that you're going to want to give in this kind of situation. Now, do you give unfractionated heparin or do you give low molecular weight heparin? It really depends upon uh, the severity of the condition. All right, so when we're treating patients for, who have acute DVTs, do we give unfractionated heparin? Do we give low molecular weight heparin? Do we give Fonda Paranox? You can really do either one of them. It just depends upon the severity of the patient. Unfractionated heparin is good for emergencies. So the reason why is you can take and give a bolus of it right? Especially if you're giving like a higher doses, you give a bolus of it. And then after that, you put them on an infusion pump, which gives them a continuous amount over a specific period of time, right? So, and depending upon the severity, you could, you know, give them unfractionated heparin, but at the same time, you could also give a sub Q injection and have them go home. And that would be something like your low molecular weight heparin. And there's actually, when we talk about low molecular weight heparins, I want to make sure that I mention um, this. There's actually two main types. Um, that are utilized. One is a little bit more common than the other, but we have what's called anoxaparin, and we have another, and this is commonly called Lovenox, brand name Lovenox, and then there's another one called Dalteparin. Okay, and again, this is something that you're going to want to remember. Whereas unfractionated heparin. Again, we just call it unfractionated, we just call it heparin. Okay, that's your main big, big boy, unfractionated heparin. You can also give this one. This one will be more for your emergencies. So I want you guys to remember that this is more for the emergent, you know, serious kind of stuff. Like if it's a really serious DVT or PE, then yeah, we should make sure that we keep them there, put them on unfractionated heparin and monitor their PTT. Whereas low molecular weight heparin, you can go ahead and send them home, and this would be something more that you can treat them for outpatient. Okay? So I just wanted to make sure that we mentioned that. So it can be used for acute DVTs, and the same concept here. If someone is having a DVT, remember, if this clot breaks off, travels through where? You guys remember your anatomy? Travels through the inferior vena cava, to the right atrium, to the right ventricle, from the right ventricle into the pulmonary arteries, Okay, and then boom, it gets lodged somewhere in there. What happens? It can lead to significant hypoxia. So because of that, you want to be very careful. So you can also treat these for patients with pulmonary embolisms, right? So pulmonary embolisms. Obviously, with these things, you can do other treatments as well. Um, but pulmonary embolism is going to be, uh, you can treat this acutely with Again, same concept here. You can treat them basically with the same things. So just remember low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin. In this kind of situation, you're more likely to go with the unfractionated heparin just because of the severity and the ser serious danger that pulmonary embolisms uh, present on a patient, okay? Now, with that being said, it's not just also for acute. So I want to make sure I remember, I, I put that down here. It's good for acute. Um, pulmonary embolisms and acute DVTs, but you can also use it for prophylaxis. So don't forget that as well. I'm going to put a little side note over here that you can use it for prophylaxis, okay, of DVT and PE, especially low dose, okay? So this would be good for low dose heparin. 
okay? Especially if someone's had some type of uh, surgical procedure which caused them to be bedridden, right? You could treat them with a low dose heparin. And again, this would be ideally your low molecular weight heparins because that's your sub-Q injections. And they have a longer half-life and they have much less side effects. But you gotta be careful. And we'll talk a little bit later about comparing the two. Low molecular weight heparin can be heavy on the kidneys, especially if somebody has already pre-existing kidney failure or decreased glomerular filtration rates. All right, sweet deal. We got acute DVTs, acute pulmonary embolisms is the main thing that I want you to remember, but you can give low doses of it for prophylaxis of DVTs and PEs. What's another reason to give heparin? Another one, guess what happens here? Let's say that for whatever reason, if you guys uh, don't know, we talked about all the different types of causes of why someone can develop um, a clot inside of the actual coronary circulation, right? We talked about that in our coronary artery disease video. But there's multiple different reasons. It's usually atherosclerotic plaques that develop because of patients who are hypertensive and so on and so forth, right? But we know that if this happens, it, it blocks blood flow to the myocardium of the heart. What we can give in patients who are suffering from what's called a STEMI or even an NSTEMI, we can treat them with heparin. Now, generally, this is gonna be your unfractionated heparin. And again, what did I tell you you're gonna do with this? You're gonna give a bolus of it. Then after that bolus is given, you're gonna do a continuous infusion through an infusion pump, okay? And you'll monitor the patient's PTT. We'll talk about what that is later. But again, unfractionated heparin, you're gonna give this to patients who have a STEMI and maybe are going to the cath lab to get PCI, or in STEMIs, and it's just their main treatment, they're not high risk, the NSTEMI doesn't have to go get PCI, so you're just gonna treat them um, with the heparin to basically prevent any types of complications from developing. So again, that's something really too important to remember here. Another thing, what if someone has atrial fibrillation? If they have atrial fibrillation, what do we say happens here? We said that the different, there's all these reentrant circuits that are firing at different times. And because of these reentrant circuits are these multiple ectopic foci that are basically firing at different points in time, the atrial contraction is very, very weak. Okay? And so because of that, we said Verco's triad means that if there is a stasis of blood flow, what can happen? You can form clots, right? So in atrial fibrillation, you can get these clots that develop usually around the valves, the mitral valve, right? And there's multiple different reasons why patients develop AFib, but here's something I, I, I gotta stress it because I don't want us to you know, think that you can uh, forget about this. If someone has non-valvular AFib, that means that their atrial fibrillation is not due to mitral valve disease or due to a prosthetic heart valve. It's some other reason. Maybe it's due to excessive catecholamines. Maybe it's due to hypoxia from some type of lung disease. Maybe it's due to methamphetamines. Whatever it might be, it, electrolyte disturbances. It's just not due to the valves being diseased in any way, shape, or form. You gotta remember that. Warfarin is the main thing that you give for patients with AFib because it can treat patients who have non-valvular AFib as well as valvular AFib. But heparin and all these other direct factor inhibitors are mainly for non-valvular AFib, okay? That's important. Now, again, you're probably wondering, okay, well then why don't I just give them warfarin? Here's why you give patients heparin, and if someone's having AFib, let's say that it's really bad, they're having severe palpitations, they're having chest pain, they're short of breath, maybe they're syncopal, whatever it is, and they are really struggling, you bring them into the emergency room, you check the EKG strip, and they're in really bad AFib with like RVR, rapid ventricular rate, right? And you try to drop their heart rate down. How do you try to drop their heart rate down? Let's say that you try to give them medications. Right? So you try to block the actual AV node. Let's say that you try to give medications that are gonna to try to slow that down. What are some of these medications? Maybe you try to give them a beta blocker. Maybe you try to give them a calcium channel blocker. Or maybe you even try to give them digoxin and just inhibit that AV node and slow down the rate so that you can allow for the ventricles to stop contracting so intensely. What if that doesn't work? You try to rate control them. So the first step you do in patients with AFib, first step, 
your rate control. If that doesn't work, the next step is to do rhythm control. So how do you do rhythm control? Well, you can do it either giving medications, again, things like um, sodium channel blockers, um, but the more likely thing that you're going to do because of the risks of torsade points with giving things like abutilide is you're going you're to shock them. Right? You're going to do what's called cardioversion. Problem with that is, is if I try to give somebody, let's say that somebody has AFib and they already have a clot that's there, okay? Then I go ahead and I shock them. So I do cardioversion, right? Let's draw a little lightning, right? So I shock the frick out of them, right? I give them a good shock and I reset the entire atrial uh, circuitry. And now the SA node starts firing beautifully and you go back into sinus rhythm. Well, now the atrial uh, contractions are going to go back to their normal efficacy, right? If they go back to their normal efficacy and they start pumping really well, then what could happen to that clot then? It could pop off. And if it pops off, it's going to pop off, then what can happen? That sucker could then go into, it could leave the left ventricle and go into the actual systemic circulation. Whenever you're giving heparin, you're giving heparin to patients who failed rate control for AFib, had to go on to rhythm control and get what's called cardioversion. And here's the thing you got to remember, if they're getting cardioverted, you never shock someone without doing an echo. You got to do a transesophageal echocardiogram to look to see if there's a clot there because if you do shock them, that sucker can break off and go to the brain. So you'll heparinize them wait for that, go have them come back, do another echo, make sure that there's no clot, and then you'll cardiovert them. But no matter what long-term effects is you have to anticoagulate them. So after you cardiovert somebody, no matter what, you have to anticoagulate them. But if you do an echo, you find a thrombus there, you don't cardiovert them, you anticoagulate them, have them come back, cardiovert them, and then put them on anticoagulants for like three to six months, okay? So you gotta remember that. So now, if we protect the patient from this type of situation with AFib, what do we protect them against downstream? You protect them from these emboli breaking off and causing a cerebral infarct, a renal infarct, right? So you're preventing a CVA. You're preventing some type, you're preventing renal infarcts. You're preventing splenic infarcts. The most dangerous one that you got to be careful of, this is the, the most dangerous one. If you don't remember any of these, at least remember the CVA. Splenic infarcts as well as mesenteric uh, ischemia, which is again mainly the SMA, and ischemic colitis, which is mainly going to be affecting the IMA or an acute arterial embolus that forms with inside of the arteries within a leg and that can lead to limb gangrene. And that's the danger of this one. In other words, the actual tissue downstream from this occlusion can start undergoing necrosis. So again, big things to remember is you're protecting them from non-valvular AFib and all the downstream effects and STEMI, STEMIs, acute DVTs and PEs, as well as low dose prophylaxis for DVT and PEs. All right, so the last thing that we need to cover is the adverse drug reactions or side effects. And again, any contraindications. We'll be able to fly through the contraindications pretty quickly and some of the ADR. So there's one big one that I want us to talk about. Rare, but I, I actually have had a family member suffer from this condition. So we do actually, I wanna talk about it because if it does happen, you need to be able to notice it. And it's called HIT. Uh, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So we'll talk about this, but we're gonna kind of fly through this. Because it's pretty simple. We've talked about in all the other anticoagulant, antiplatelet uh, videos. What's the risk of putting someone on an anticoagulant? Bleeding. And again, how do we notice this? What are some things that we wanna look for that we just don't miss? Look for bleeding in different surfaces or orifices. So if someone's bleeding from their gingiva, so if they have gingival bleeding, that could be a sign. Oh, they're on too much of this. Or if this uh, share looking person is bleeding from their nostril holes, right? So they have anterior epistaxis. That should also be a sign. 
or if you start seeing a lot of pinpoint hemorrhages or large, pin, large pinpoint hemorrhages or large bruising within the skin. And again, this could be petechiae, this could be uh, purpura, which are just larger petechial lesions. It could be ecchymosis, which are very large bruising. Again, look for any of those signs. That could be that they're bleeding a lot, right? What if they have blood in the urine, right? So you have blood in the urine, hematuria. That's something to watch out for as well. What if they have blood in the poop, right? So they have hematochesia. Or the blood in the actual stool is dark, melena. Okay, what if they're vomiting up blood, hematemesis? Or what if we don't even know that and they just have iron deficiency anemia? Okay, and again, because maybe they're losing blood, but it's not visible. Remember what I told you to do here? Do a fecal occult blood test. That's important to do. Always test for that if you think that someone is actually having blood loss. Again, you could do a CBC as well. So we'll put that down there, CBC, just to check their MCV as well and their hemoglobin. Other things, if someone is having heavy vaginal bleeding or menstrual periods, so if you see anything like that, that is important. Now, one of the big things you gotta remember is when someone is actually treated with heparin, you can sometimes give them too much heparin and they can bleed too much. Whenever someone is given too much, you wanna remember the antidote. And that antidote is called protamine sulfate, okay? Protamine sulfate is the main antidote that you treat patients with who are actually you're given too much heparin and they're adversely bleeding more than you want. Protamine sulfate is more effective against unfractionated heparin and a little bit less effective against um, uh, the low molecular weight heparin like anoxaparin and dalteparin. And it actually doesn't really affect the Fonda Paranox. If you really want to remember, there is another one for Fonda Paranox. It's, it's, it might work. It's not as great as protamine sulfate for unfractionated and low molecular weight heparin. But PCC, this would be good for the Fonda Paranox. Okay? All right, so I want you guys to remember these are the big, big side effects. What else do we need to talk about? Again, we said this heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Pretty rare reaction, but again, you wanna be aware of it. What happens is, let's say that someone, let's do the easy thing. Let's say that they've actually, they've had heparin before. When they have heparin, for some reason, their body reacts to specific things, like what, here, here's what happens, right? Remember we have heparin. Heparin can actually sometimes cause these, it can bind to inactivated platelets, okay? On platelets, they have this specific molecule here called platelet factor four. So here we have what's called platelet factor four. Sometimes what can happen is when the heparin reacts with this actual platelet through the platelet, uh, platelet factor four, so here we can put here some heparin, we'll put in combination here, we'll put H. This can cause this complex to become immunogenic, okay? So when platelet factor four and heparin combine on this platelet surface, it can become immunogenic. I actually need to write that down. That's very important because that could be some type of question that you might get on an exam, but it is immunogenic. And what that means is, is your immune system is going to respond to that. So how does it do that? Let's say here we have some antibodies that are made by your plasma cells, okay? So your plasma cells make these specific types of antibodies, and these are IgG antibodies. These IgG antibodies will then combine, and we're gonna draw this in simplicity now, let's say that we draw here a platelet factor four here, let me make it a little bit bigger, and we're just gonna draw the heparin as a red dot here. This immunogenic complex, this antibody will bind onto. When it binds onto this, two things can happen. One is it can actually tag these platelets for destruction by the spleen. So now let's draw a cute little spleen. We drew it green over here. So let's say here we're gonna draw a cute little spleen. And these are gonna get taken to the spleen so they get tagged. We'll put here tagged, right? And then the macrophages, which are inside of the spleen, are actually going to break this down. So then they'll get destroyed by the actual spleen. Another thing that can happen is 
is it can activate the platelets. So now if I would draw a platelet here, look at this platelet. It is ready to cause some bad, bad problems. This dude is ready to start causing a lot of issues. What do I mean? Well, now it's got this tag thing here, right? We got the heparin, we got the platelet factor four. This is our immunogenic complex here. Then we got our IgG antibody that's binding to this. Guess what this does? This activates the platelet. And now, if this platelet is activated, guess what starts binding to it? Other platelets. And so guess what will result out of that? If I have a bunch of platelets that start increasing and binding to one another, what does that mean? I'm gonna form a clot. So these platelets will get consumed in forming clots, but they'll also get destroyed by the spleen. What's the end result? If they get consumed in clots, as well as they're getting destroyed, what's the overall result? A decrease in platelets. If there is a decrease in platelets, what is the name for that? Thrombocytopenia. Now, if you form all these clots, where can they go? They can, they can actually go to different places in the body. Some of them that they can actually go to is going to be in the veins of the leg, and it can form DVTs. It could then travel from that DVT and go to the lungs and cause a PE. It could also travel to the myocardium of the heart and cause a myocardial infarction. It could also travel to the, the actual central nervous system and cause a CVA, cerebrovascular accident, as well as something that's not as common, but it, it can happen. It's also called uh, cerebral venous thrombosis. So remember both of these, cerebral venous thrombosis and cerebral vascular accident is another thing that it can cause. And you don't want to forget that it also has the capability of forming clots within inside of the legs, the arterial circulation, and causing an acute arterial occlusion, which can lead to limb gangrene, okay? So these are things that you're going to be careful of. You see how serious this could be? So what can happen if you give someone heparin that's already been, let's say that, I want to make sure I'm very specific here because I don't want to confuse anybody. If you've never received heparin and you have this reaction for the first time, it takes about maybe one to two weeks before this reaction to occur because you have to produce antibodies against it. But let's say that you've received heparin in the past. Now you're going to have those antibodies that are gonna be made against this immunogenic complex. So let's say that you received heparin two years ago, you have, for some reason you get a DVT, you come in, you gotta get treated with heparin, guess what can happen within a day? You can actually have this response. And you can develop clots all over the body and you can have these widespread clots as well as decrease in platelets. This is called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia where you have decrease in platelets but you have the paradoxical clotting process here. So. How do we diagnose this? There's this very specific test that they utilize. Um, it's called the serotonin release assay. This test is probably one of the coolest tests ever. I just, lo I love this test. Serotonin release assay. This is your gold standard test. And what they do is they take the person's serum, which should have the antibodies, right? Should have these IgG antibodies in it. Let's draw that here. They take the patient's serum, which should have, assuming that you've been ex exposed to it in the past or you've made it, you take these IgG antibodies which are in the serum, okay, assuming that it is. So this is the patient's serum. You take some donor platelets, okay? So you take these platelets, these donor platelets, and you combine them. You put these donor platelets in them, and the donor platelets should have this platelet factor four, okay? And again, you're also gonna have heparin there. What should happen then is if your platelets get activated, what are those chemicals that it releases? This is so cool. You guys remember what are the chemicals it releases when it gets activated? ADP, thromboxane A2, and serotonin. 
5-hydroxytryptamine. So, if these IgG antibodies are there, you give them donor platelets with the PF4, and again, there's gonna be heparin within the solution, it triggers that immunogenic complex, binds to the platelet, activates the platelet, what should be in high concentrations in this final tube? An increase in 5-hydroxytryptamine, or serotonin. And that would be a positive test. So if there's elevated levels of serotonin, that's a positive sign for heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Isn't that cool? So what do you do? Stop, stop giving them this heparin. So the treatment is really, relatively simple. Treatment, discontinue heparin. And then put them on another medication, which we'll talk about in another video. So we'll switch to another medication, which is going to be a, a direct uh, factor two inhibitor. And these would be things like um, argotriban. And we'll talk about that in another video. So you'll switch them to a direct factor two inhibitor, things like argotriban. All right, so last thing, and we're gonna pretty much blow through this, contraindications. It's relatively simple. You don't wanna give it to someone who's bleeding, okay? If they have uncontrollable bleeding for whatever reason, they have a, you know, a, some type of condition, any uncontrollable bleeding, this is not something that you're gonna to wanna to give to somebody. If they just recently had a CVA, why, why is that important? If someone just had an ischemic stroke and you give them heparin, what can you do? You can convert what's an ischemic stroke into a hemorrhagic transformation. And that's a very serious thing that we don't wanna ha happen. Okay, we also don't wanna give this to patients who have uncontrollable hypertension because obviously if they have uncontrolled high blood pressure, what are they at risk for? aortic dissections, aortic aneurysms, and therefore bleeding. So again, it's pretty simple. You just want to avoid that. Now, here's what a really important one that I don't want you guys to forget. You guys want to remember this one because it is key to knowing when you use which medication. If someone has, now generally, heparins. Remember I told you there's unfractionated heparin and there's low molecular weight heparin. Don't worry about the Fonda Paranox. These are the two main ones that I want you to know. The unfractionated heparin I want you to remember that it's actually nice to the kidney, okay? It's not really super, super hardcore on the kidney. The low molecular weight heparin, this is bad on the kidney. It can be pretty rough. And really, in order for this guy to really be excreted through the kidneys, it needs a good glomerular filtration rate. Approximately, you want it to be greater than 30 milliliters per minute on the creatinine clearance, okay? You'd like it to be. But let's say that their creatinine clearance drops. So someone is showing signs of renal failure. Let's say that they're in renal failure. Okay? And what happens as a result of that? Their creatinine clearance drops, or their GFR is going to drop. If it drops to anything less than 30 milliliters per minute, you should not be giving them low molecular weight heparin. This is a no go. All right? So if this is the case, this is a no-go. You do not give low molecular weight heparin, you switch to the unfractionated heparin. So again, that is an important thing to remember as a potential contraindication in patients who are receiving heparin. If they have signs of renal failure or the GFR drops less than 30 milliliters per minute, do not give low molecular weight heparin, switch to the unfractionated heparin. Or if you want to, you can just make sure that you very, very carefully control their dosage. Okay? But it, it's a relative contraindication in these patients. All right. Last thing I want to mention, I talked about that PTT. If you guys remember, PTT is called the, here we're going to mark it down here, PTT is called the partial thromboplastin time. And we're going to put a little A in front of it and I'm going to explain why. So PTT, let's write this out here, is called the partial thromboplastin time. It's the time it takes for the intrinsic and common pathway to occur, okay? So it's the time it takes for factor 12 to activate factor 11, to activate factor 9, to combine with 8, activate 10, convert th uh, prothrombin into thrombin, activate the fibrinogen, and turn it into fibrin, and form a clot. So because of that, it's gonna be longer than the PT, which was the prothrombin time, which was the measure of the extrinsic pathway and the common pathway, right? 
So what do we do? We take the patient's plasma. So let's say that this is my plasma, okay? We take the plasma, we send it to the lab. The lab then takes um, a specific molecule. They call it, the only reason that I'm mentioning this A here is that, uh, so you don't get confused whenever you see someone, they write it as PTT or APTT. They're really the same thing. The only thing that you're just specifying is that if there's A in front of it, you combined what's called an activator. So in the lab, they throw in a specific molecule. Um, I think usually they use things like uh, silica as a common activator, and they'll, so they'll write like silica. And they'll throw that in there, and that's supposed to basically help to trigger the activation of factor 12. Okay? And that'll start this whole process. So what you want to know is how long does it take for me, once I add in the silica into this actual solution, to activate factor 12, how long is it going to take before the blood clots to go through the intrinsic and the common pathway? Now, normal PTT is uh, usually, usually 30 to 40 seconds. That's like the average, so we'll put here again, we'll keep consistent. APTT, the activated partial thromboplasma time, is usually 30 to 40 seconds. But now, think about this. You give someone heparin. Remember what heparin does. It affects thrombin, which is a part of your common pathway. It also affects factor eight, right? Because thrombin, and it also affects factor 10. So it does have an effect on the common and the intrinsic pathway. So if you give heparin, so now think about this. If you give heparin, what's gonna happen now to this whole co uh, coagulation process? It should take a longer period of time. So now the time it takes for the blood to clot, it should be longer because I'm giving an anticoagulant. So what we want is, we want the activated partial thromboplasma time, and we're gonna put here no heparin. We want afterwards the activated partial thromboplastin time, the activated partial thromboplastin time, we want this one to be somewhere 1.5 to 2.5 times the normal range. I'm gonna put just NR, which is this, the 30 to 40 seconds. And this is for heparin, okay? So this is with heparin, okay? That is the significance of this PTT. All right, let's, let's take, for example, here, the lower limit, okay? So we say that the PTT, let's say that we take 30, right? That's the lower limit of this normal range. We multiply it by 1.5, okay? So if I multiply this by 1.5, so that's 30 times 1.5, that's equal to 45, okay? Now I'm gonna take the other example. Let's say I take the upper limit of the normal range, 40 and I multiply that by the upper range of the with heparin. So now 2.5, that's equal to 100. Here's what I want you to remember. If the PTT is less than 45, what does that mean? That means that I don't have enough heparin. It's, it's clotting relatively quickly, close to the normal range without heparin. We don't want that. Now, that means I don't have enough heparin and I'm more likely to clot. So again, if the PTT is less than 45, which is kind of like the lowest range of this part here with heparin, that means there's not enough and you're more likely to clot. If the PTT is greater than 100, that means I'm outside of the normal range with heparin. And now I gave too much heparin and the patient is more likely to bleed, okay? So we have to be able to be aware of this range, okay? given these numbers whenever somebody is put on heparin, okay? Last thing that I'm gonna talk about here, we talked about a little bit in parts of this video here, is that again, unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin, I just want you guys to really know when do I give this one, what's the big difference between these two? Unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin, what about their administration? So remember, this unfractionated can be given IV, but it can also be given sub, Q, okay? Low molecular weight heparin is mainly sub-Q administration, okay? So that's one big thing. The next thing that I want you to remember is half-life. Unfractionated heparin has a very short 
half-life. I wouldn't say very short, but it's like four times less than low molecular weight heparin. So this one is actually gonna have a longer half-life. And that's nice because one of the reasons why that's important is if you have a longer half-life, you don't have to take it as often. And that's good because this is good for outpatient types of situations. Next thing, what about kidney function? Remember, unfractionated heparin is nice to your kidneys. It's kind of good whenever someone does have renal failure. But low molecular weight heparin is kind of rough on the kidneys. And if someone has less than 30 milliliters per minute, it's not something that you're going to want to give. The other thing that I want you to remember is side effects. Which one is more likely to cause bleeding? The unfractionated heparin is more likely to cause bleeding. Whereas the low molecular weight heparin is less likely to cause bleeding. Okay. Now, the other thing is if you really want to remember the heparin induced thrombocytopenia, it's actually more common in here. We'll throw that in there. HIT is more common in unfractionated heparin administration and less common with the low molecular weight heparin use. Okay, and the last thing that we gotta mention here is that, and again, we didn't talk about it a ton here, but what I want you to remember here is that unfractionated heparin is really the heparin that we use for monitoring the PTT. Go back to the reason why. Unfractionated heparin inhibits both factors two, thrombin, and factor 10. So it is primarily the one that we use, the APTT, to monitor. The low molecular weight heparin, like anoxaparin and dalteparin, we don't really use the PTT. If you remember why, he only inhibits factor 10, right? And then indirectly, factor two. So because of that, because he doesn't affect thrombin, we really don't use the PTT for him. So we monitor factor 10, A, activity. Okay, and that's what's going to give us, you know, how well this actual low molecular weight heparin is, is, is doing in the body, especially if someone has kidney failure. Okay, so again, one big thing that I want you to forget, low molecular, low molecular weight heparin, we monitor factor 10 activity, unfractionated heparin, which is the heparin we're talking about here with the PTT, that we measure with the APTT. And if you really want to remember Fonda Paranox, we mainly can also use factor 10A activity as well. Okay. So that's the big things that I want you guys to know for heparin. Hi, right, engineers. So I hope this video made sense. I really do hope that you guys did enjoy it. If you guys did, please smash that like button, comment down in the comment section, and subscribe. Seriously, subscribe. Also, if you guys can, go down in the description box. We'll have links to our Patreon account, our Facebook, our Instagram. Go check those out. Engineers, we love you. And as always, until next time.